Yeah, and we're going to do a song um, from our cantata um, that we're going to do. The whole choir does it. We'd like to do it to the, this morning. And it's called The Debt. As we sing the song, I want you to try and picture in your mind what the, the, the journey that Christ took from the time they laid him on the cross to the time he rose from the grave. And, and if you think about it, you know, he went through a horrible death, a terrible death, but he did it because it was a debt that we owed. And it's a debt that he paid for our sins. And we're going to try this. I'm not sure how it's going to work out. Uh, my throat isn't really good. It's been cracking like crazy this morning, Jeanine. So we're going to try this, and we're going to do our best and just enjoy the music and just picture what the, the journey that Christ took when he carried that cross to Calvary and the, the, uh, the wounds that he received, especially the stripes on his back, because with those stripes we are healed. Amen. And uh, so we're going to try this, the dead. Okay, Andrew. As the soldiers laid the cross on his back that day, I followed the blood-stained footprints he left as they led him away.
<laughs> it always is when they say. It always is. You're up. I'm up. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh oh. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Okay. Well, we got some work to do here, just quickly here. We've got a few minutes. Now, I know we have people from different parts of the country and that type of thing, but uh, I grew up in West Virginia and grew up in Morgantown. I was a Mountaineer fan, been a Mountaineer fan all my life. And on one side of the stadium or the Coliseum, they would yell, let's go. The other side would say Mountaineers. And I'm telling you, the, and, 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 and their football team's not very good. And they're getting excited about a football game. Now, we're here this morning to celebrate the greatest event that has ever happened in the history of this world. And you're praising the Lord like that? So we're going to try this again. And if you can't do better than they do at West Virginia when they're saying, let's go Mountaineers, then we might as well just walk out that door right now. Okay? Praise the Lord. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. Amen. 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 Much better. Much better. In fact, the event was so terrific, the greatest event in the history of the world that we are going to have a victory party immediately after church today down in the basement. Amen. So everyone, if you want to come to a victory party this morning, and I'm not sure if anyone's ever had an opportunity to go to a victory party. I know a lot of people go to maybe like a Super Bowl party and, uh, and eat pizza and wings and chips and all that stuff. And a lot of you guys will go to like the final four of the championship, the NCAA basketball tournament, including March Madness, and you have a big party for that. Well, we're having a resurrection party after church this morning downstairs, a victory party. We expect everyone to come out for that today. So please, please uh, keep that in your schedule. You don't have anywhere else to be. We're going to start it when uh, we're finished here. And we're, you know, we're, we're scheduled for Sunday school at 9 o'clock, but you know what? If the victory party keeps on going, it keeps on going, we don't have to have Sunday school. We don't have to have Sunday school today. We can just keep on celebrating the risen Savior. What a day this is. I lost my glasses. You are in trouble, I am in trouble. Oh, there they are. I found them. Thank you. I have a poem I'd like to read to you this morning. Tomb, you shall not hold him longer. Death is strong, but life is stronger. Stronger than the dark, the light. Stronger than the wrong, the right. Faith and hope triumphant say, Christ will rise on Easter day. While the patient earth lies waiting till the morning shall be breaking, shuddering beneath the burden dread of her master, cold and dead. Hark, she hears the angel say, Christ will rise on Easter day. And when sunrise smites the mountain, pouring light from heavenly fountains, then the earth blooms out to greet once again the blessed feet, and her countless voices say, Christ has risen on Easter day. Amen. 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 Well, I read this morning, taken out of the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16. And all four of the Gospel writers make count of this event. Mark, chapter 16, beginning in verse 1. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices to the so it brought spices that they might uh, go and anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. And they entered the tomb, and they saw a young man dressed in white, in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. 
He has risen. He is not here. See the place where he, they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. I get so excited when I read, I look ahead too far. Let's pray. Our Lord God, we thank you. May we give you praise and honor and glory. Amen. Oh, Lord God, how we can shout glory this morning. Glory. <coughs> praise and honor to you, Lord. And now, Lord God, just pray and ask him, an anointing upon my lips this morning is to bring a message to the church. That we have the open hearts, Lord God, to receive your word. And that we can go away from this place, this house this morning, rejoicing and saying it was good to be in the house of the Lord today. And Lord God, if there's anyone here that doesn't know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, that this event that's written is just a, a something written on pages. If they don't know, then it's my prayer this morning, Lord God, that they come to know you. Come to know Jesus Christ as our Savior this morning. And we come before you, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 So, I don't know if anyone here grew up reading Dear Abby or not. Uh, but Dear Abby wrote an article one time in, 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 in response to a question. They'd asked her a question. She would give them a response. And so she, she uh, had an article one time, a long time ago, where someone wrote, and here's what she said. She talked about an affluent family, and they had a little boy named Bill. And Bill grew up, and, and it was finally time for Bill to graduate from high school. And being in this affluent neighborhood that they lived in, it was the custom of that neighborhood for the parents to buy the graduating child a new automobile. That's just where they live, and that's how things were done. So Bill and his father, for months and months prior to graduation, would go car shopping, and they would look at this car and that car, and these options and that options, and this color and that color, and finally they decided on this particular car. And Bill was excited. Well, it came time for graduation, he went through the ceremony, and he goes home, and he's having his graduation party, and his father gives him a gift-wrapped Bible. Well, Bill, in his disgust, <coughs> took the Bible, and he threw it down, stomped out the door, never to see his father again. And so, years and years later, 30 years later, he hears of his father's passing. And he goes back home to be with the family. And he's looking at his inheritance, and he comes across this Bible that he was given. And it has dust all over it, and he wipes the dust off the Bible. And he opens the Bible up, and inside the Bible is a cashier's check made out on the day of his graduation for the amount of the car, the price for the car, the automobile. It makes you wonder. Do we treat God's word with contempt? Do we just take his word and just toss it aside? Is this book full of a lot of maybe empty promises? Or is there something real about what's written in this book? Is there something that we can grasp hold of? Are the things written in this book maybe too good to be true? Because, you know, that's the day and age, that's the world that we live in today. We live in a world where things just seem to be too good to be true. We see things advertised on television, and they want you to buy this, and they want you to buy this because it's going to fulfill all your needs. And then to make things even better, not only will they give you one, but they'll give you five for the price of one. That's how good their product is. Only for you to get the product and to be disappointed. I don't think my mother ever did figure out how to work a Vegematic. <laughs> but Jesus, God, is not like that. He's not like that at all. 
every promise written in this book, everything written in this book, is not like the world. But I do want to talk to you this morning about three empty promises written in this book. Three empty promises in the Bible. So what I want to do this morning is I want you to, if you can, go back into time with me. Go back into time 2,000 years ago on that first Easter. That first Easter morning. We read in the scriptures and all the gospel accounts how on the first day of the week, which is symbolic of today for us, it says that the women rose early because they had a task to do. They, they, they had to go. They, they, they had to anoint the body of Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea and, and, uh, and um, Nicodemus perhaps maybe just didn't fulfill the job quite right. So these women had to go to the tomb. And they had to finish anointing the body of Jesus. So we take the walk with these ladies, and I'm sure there was a quiet walk down the road and perhaps down a pathway leading to the tomb. And so if you can, just envision with me, and we're perhaps walking with these women, and they're walking quietly. And it says that they left before sunrise. But I'm sure that as they perhaps reached the top of a little knoll in the path they were going, Perhaps in the little distance, they could see a gruesome mountain. The people, the locals, called it the place of the skull, Golgotha. And upon Golgotha, they could see the silhouettes of three crosses. Three crosses that still remain upon the hillside because yesterday was the Sabbath. And the crosses weren't taken down. And so they see the three crosses on the hillside. And they focus on the one that was in the middle. The cross that was in the middle. And the more they looked at that cross in the distance, they were envisioning in their mind the Lord upon that cross. But he wasn't there. They could see the blood that was sitting on top of the cross from where they had the crown of thorns planted upon his skull and blood came out of his head. They could see it on the top. They could see on each side of the cross blood dripping still from where they drove the spikes, they drove the nails into their Lord's wrists. <coughs> And they could see the main beam of the cross with blood drenched on it from where the Roman soldiers just a couple days prior to that beat their Savior to the point of death. And then where the Roman soldier took a spear and drove it into the side and the blood came gushing out. blood-soaked cross that they see in the distance. Oh, what reminders have brought them. But that cross is empty. That cross is empty. Jesus himself died upon that cross for the forgiveness of all of our sins. If we were to only accept that. <clears throat> to accept the price that was paid at Golgotha, at Calvary, at the skull. It says in the scriptures, without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins. 
He was the Lamb of God who took all of our sins away. Sin. Not a real popular term today. It's not a politically correct term in our country today as we live in the 21st century. People like to avoid this conversation anytime you talk about sin because they don't want to look in the mirror and look at the reflection back at them and think of the sins that's plaguing their lives. Their wrongdoings where they have fallen short of the glory of God because when a person sins... We have fallen way short of God's glory. And there's nobody, nobody that has ever lived on this earth besides Jesus Christ who is sinless. We've all sinned. Each and every one of us in this room and each and every person who's lived through the centuries past and anyone who will live into the future has sinned. And only one person then could pay the price for all of our sins. It wasn't Abraham. Father Abraham, it wasn't Abraham. It wasn't David. It's certainly not Muhammad or any of the other prophets. <coughs> and I don't classify Muhammad as a prophet. But none of the prophets of the Bible, none of them, was worthy enough, was perfect to be a sacrifice for our sins. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. An empty cross. The ladies look at that as they're walking on the road. And they reflect the words of Jesus. How he told them what was going to happen to them. So they refocus and they're continuing on their journey to the tomb. And all of a sudden the earth starts to quake. It starts to rumble. And they gather themselves thinking, what was that? Not real sure. But they continue on their journey as they're, as they're walking. One of the ladies says to the others, she said, who's going to roll this tomb away for us? or the stone away from the tomb for us. Who's going to do that? See, because what they did is, is after Jesus died upon that cross, and let me tell you this morning, he did die upon that cross. I want to go back to that point just real quick. He did die upon that cross. He didn't fake it. He wasn't partially dead or almost dead. He was dead. He was dead. And so much so, to make sure that he was dead, a Roman soldier pierced his side where blood and water flowed. Jesus was dead. Okay? Understand that. So they buried him in this tomb. And so as these women are walking along, they are just wondering, who's going to roll the stone away from this tomb? See, they put a tomb over top of this, a uh, stone over top of the tomb, because, you know what? The Jews were afraid that someone may come and steal the body of Jesus and then say, hey, he rose from the dead like they, you know, they told him before. And so they put this big stone in and they put a Roman seal on it, you know. And you're not allowed to mess with the Roman seal. They put guards out there. Could you imagine? Could you imagine 11 of these apostles, fishermen, tax collectors, and other uh, just quote, insignificant people of the day, overpowering Roman guards and rolling a, a two or three ton stone away from the tomb to steal the body of Jesus. But they were fearful of that. So this, this stone is there. So these women are wondering, who's going to roll this stone away? And they have this earthquake. And they make it to the garden. And they see Roman soldiers lying unconscious on the ground. The stone that they were so concerned about wasn't covering the tomb anymore. It has been rolled away. And sitting on top of the stone was an angelic being, an angel of God, glowing. Simply telling them, the one you are seeking is not here. But he has risen. 
go and tell his disciples and Peter the empty tomb the cross for the forgiveness of our sins the empty tomb saying that Jesus is not here his body was not stolen but he has been raised from the dead Amen. him being raised from the dead simply tells me this because he lives I can live. Because he lives, I have eternal life with him in heaven. Forever and ever. The empty tomb. Jesus is not there. He's not there. And no one came and stole his body. Because these women, in their excitement, they do, they run back. And they tell the disciples, and they tell Peter what had happened. And John and, and Peter, out of their excitement, and maybe their confusion, still not quite understanding everything that Jesus told them about, they get up and they take off for the tomb, and, and they sprint. And the scripture says that John got there before Peter did. And he looked inside the tomb, and lo and behold, the body wasn't there. And then finally Peter catches up, and Peter doesn't even wait. He just busts right in. He goes right past John, and he just goes right in. And John follows. Jesus is not in the tomb. But what do they see? Empty linen. Empty linen. The burial clothes of Jesus lying there. I believe every piece was folded up neatly. Mm -hmm. Just lying there. Empty. There's no body in it. And certainly no one stole, stole the body of Jesus because if they would have stole the body of Jesus, do you think they would have taken the linens off and laid them there? They would have just grabbed him and went. But the linens Jesus wants to have a personal relationship with you. He wants to come and commune with you. He wants to sit with you and talk with you. He wants to walk with you. And he wants to have fellowship with you. And he can do that because he lives. And if you accept him into your life, he can come and he can live inside of you. He can come and live inside of your heart. And you can have that fellowship with him all the time. He's just not a part-time savior. He, is, he can be, if, if you accept him in your life, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the rest of your life. Yes, in this life we'll have troubles, and yes, in this life we'll have sorrows and difficulties and challenges. But because we have a risen Savior, one that we come this morning here to celebrate and to honor and to worship because He lives, All the challenges and struggles that we have are meaningless. What is this earth compared to what we have in store for us in eternity? Because he lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Whatever challenges may come my way. To have that relationship with him. We are not a religion as other religions are of this world where their patriarchs are dead and buried or imaginary or an object of some sort we have a relationship because Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God, 
went to the cross, which is now empty, was buried, and rose again, and the grave is now empty. <coughs> and the burial clothes that he was wrapped in is empty. don't know him this morning as your Lord and Savior and want a relationship with him. This altar is open. You can come up and pray and I'll pray with you. And we can make it right today for you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, again, we come to give you glory and honor. We thank you, Lord God, we thank you. We thank you, Lord God, for what was done for us at Calvary and what was done for us at the tomb. And Lord God, we just pray and ask that we can live our lives reflecting who you are. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, I was thinking of the promises that are written in this book. And they are not empty promises. They are not empty promises. But I was thinking, you know, just a second ago, and I don't know why, but I was thinking of uh, warranties. Warranties. You know, or guarantees. And I remember, you guys, you must be, uh, anybody over the age of maybe 35 guys, you will know this. But you know, craftsmen used to have a guarantee on their tools that says if they broke, you could take it back, and no questions asked, they would just replace it. And something happened to that warranty along the way, so I don't think it's quite that way anymore. And uh, John Maxwell tells a story. Uh, he's a uh, Christian speaker, uh, preacher, writer. Uh, he tells a story of a time that he bought a, a sports jacket at Nordstrom's. And it had unconditional warranty or guarantee that no matter what, if he didn't like it or something happened, unconditional, no questions asked. And he said he had the sports jacket. He said he got the jacket and he said he put, you know, he, he got it and he wore it and it just didn't look right, didn't really like it, and it got lint all over it all the time. And, but he wore it pretty consistently for six months. Finally, he just hung it up and just said, forget that. But then about a year later, he remembered the warranty that Nordstrom said they had. No questions asked. So he thought, well, what the heck? I'm going to take a chance at it. So he took his sports jacket. Uh, just to make it good, he got some lint and threw some lint on it just so he could show them how it took the lint and took them to Nordstrom's. And, and he thought maybe, boy, you know, he said, walk in, he said, that feels like I'm scamming him a little bit. You know, I don't know if I should do this or not. But he said, I'm going to be honest with him and tell him what it is. So he had his little speech prepared, and when he walked in, he said, listen, he said, I want to see if your warranty is as good as it is. I bought this jacket, and he explained, a year and a half ago. I wore it for six months a lot. I don't really like the color of it. It collects a lot of lint. He said, I want to see, does your warranty apply? And the salesperson at Nordstrom simply said, for heaven's sakes, what took you so long? Let's get you another jacket. And, you know, that's what God is maybe asking you this morning Maybe he's been tugging at your heart, waiting for you to accept him into your heart, into, into your life. And maybe today's that day. And then you're going to recall, he's going to simply say to you, for heaven's sakes, what took you so long? You know? Listen, we're having our victory party downstairs. You've got to stay and celebrate with us, please. So we're going to, as we dismiss, I'm going to go ahead and ask God's blessing upon our fellowship time together. And again, whether we have Sunday school or not, it doesn't matter. So let's come before the Lord in prayer.